The first one comes from Mark chapter 6, starting at verse 1. He, being Jesus, went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is the wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Joses, and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there, except that he had laid hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. Second Bible reading comes from Matthew chapter 8, starting at verse 5. When he had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him, Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from the east and the west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And to the centurion, Jesus said, go. Let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. And this is God's word. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Eliza. Uh, and thank you all for being here with us today. Now, uh, if you are just joining us, uh, and if we haven't met again, uh, if you're just walking in the room, my name's Arnaldo, lead pastor here. And we've been working our way through a series called Set the Sail. And this was birthed out of a conviction for us that the Lord is, is getting ready uh, to do something real and to do something special in and in and amongst the global church today. And, and we believe that the conditions are set and we do not want to be unaware of what the Lord is doing in our world. We're desperate, maybe not desperate enough yet, but we are desperate to see a work of God happen here through this church. We are desperate to see the Lord reveal himself afresh in power so that sleepy Christians would wake up and uh, unbelievers would come near and we would repent and all experience the grace and love of Jesus. And this series has been an exploration, an exploration of the, the, the various facets of revival, of what we're calling a divine renewal. And we've been exploring uh, uh, what God does in renewal, but also what, what we do. What, what is our part to see what God wants to be done come to pass? And in fact, it's this quote from G. Campbell Morgan that has been instrumental as we have thought about the relationship between our work and God's work as he brings about revival. And revival, let me just give you a definition. Revival is, is that we would be woken up to the glory of Jesus. That's all it means. And it just means that there are many people at the same time, maybe in some extraordinary ways and maybe in an, in an accelerated fashion, that are actually waking up to see who Jesus actually is. That is all I mean when I say revival. And G. Campbell Morgan, he said this. He says, we cannot organize revival. We cannot put it on. We, can, we cannot schedule a revival meeting. But we can set our sails to catch the wind from heaven when God chooses to blow upon his people once again. Now, I've never been on a sailboat, uh, but some of you I know have. 
uh, and, and you, you, you know what the work is. You, you have to hoist and you have to set the sail. Now, now, that alone doesn't get you to where you want or need to be, but that sets the conditions whereby when the wind comes, it actually takes you where you're planning to go. And, and this is the case. This is the case that, uh, that, that, that while, while God is absolutely sovereign, meaning that he is in control, we still have something to do. This is another way of, of the, the quote that I'm sure you, you, you're getting sick of and you're going to, I want to burn this in your mind. St. Augustine said what? I bet half of y'all can recite this, right? That without God, we can't. But without us, he won't. Now, now, we can argue philosophically about what that means and, and why does God choose to use us. I don't know. He so chooses that he is going to bring about his purposes not apart from us. He wants to use us. God is absolutely free and sovereign and in control and, not but, and we are absolutely responsible for our actions and to partner with God in seeing what he wants to come about. One of these does not diminish the other. And I feel like every, every week as I'm sitting to open up the scriptures and I'm, I'm sitting to, to reflect on who God is, I just feel this is a word for our church. We need to understand that there's something for us to do. We, we must, we must understand that there's lots for us to do. There's nothing for us to prove that's different. There's nothing for us to prove, but there's a lot for us to to do, because the fact of the matter is, is that we can often time hide our inactivity, our lifelessness, our laziness, or our disobedience behind a theological uh, argument about the sovereignty of God. That, that's what we do, right? We use, it's, it's interesting, we use theology to run from God. We use theology to run from what God is calling us to do. But so, God's sovereignty does not excuse us from our work. It empowers our work. You see that? It doesn't excuse you from not doing, it actually empowers you to actually do it. This is why Paul, when he's writing to this small church in a town called Philippi, he'll say this. He says, therefore, my beloved, my loved ones, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Now, now let, let me give you a quick grammar lesson. What, what, that, what that's saying, it, that, that is an, that's an imperative, what he's asking you to do. An imperative tells you what to do. So if I were to ask you, get up, turn on the lights, that's an imperative. That's a direction. I'm giving you something to do. And this is an imperative. He's saying, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. But why? For, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. And so which one is it? Both get to work because God is sovereign. Get to work because God is moving. Get to work because he has both given you the, the wanting and the willing and the desire and the ability to partner with him. Not because God is unable to do so by himself, but simply because he is pleased to call you to go to work with him. And there's nothing, nothing in this universe that is more glorious than the idea that we actually get to partner with God. Nothing. And so last week, we talked about the new birth. Last week, we talked about uh, uh, the, the way that someone goes from, in our terms, uh, goes from being a non-Christian to a Christian. How someone goes from being uh, dead to the things of God to being alive to the things of God. And in Ezekiel 36 and 34, he gave us three pictures, three, three word pictures of God's work in salvation and revival. He breathes new life into us. He gives us a new heart. He cleanses us from our sins. He revives, he renews, and, his, and he redeems. That's his work. We cannot bring that about. There is no part of us that while we were dead in our trespasses and sins, that we can actually please God. There's nothing, we, a, a dead person can't do something, right? And that was last week. And today, what we're going to focus on is our response to the new birth. What does it look like now when God raises us up, when, when he wakes us up to who Jesus is, what actually then has to happen? What is our response? Namely, it's this, it's faith. There are only, last week, we looked at uh, Ezekiel 36 and 37, but we also looked at John chapter 3. And if you remember, John chapter 3 is this scene where Nicodemus, and if you've seen The Chosen, you know this very well, where Nicodemus goes up to Jesus 
under the guise of night, and he has a conversation. Now, Nicodemus is a religious leader. Nicodemus was known. He was actually quite well known in his circles. And you have this religious leader who should have all the answers going to this kind of rebel rogue prophet Jesus in the middle of the night to ask him questions. And Jesus tells him, do not marvel. Do not be surprised. Why are you so, aren't you a teacher of Israel? Shouldn't you know that you need to be born again? Shouldn't you know that you need to be born of the spirit? And so in in John chapter three, you have Nicodemus marveling. But in our text, you have the two times, uh, which Eliza read in Mark six and Matthew chapter eight, only two times in all of the gospels that Jesus is said to marvel twice. He said to marvel twice. There are only two places in all of scripture where Jesus marvels, and it's at at these things. He marvels at the presence of faith, and he marvels at the lack of it. He marvels only twice. He marvels, he's surprised, he is shocked, as it were, when faith is present in a place where it shouldn't be. And then he marvels, he is shocked, when he finds out that where faith should be present, it isn't. And this is what we need to see. If we want God to move, and we do, This church exists to pursue the presence of God for the sake of the world. And if we want God to move, this is what we need to see. God will wait until he is wanted. God will wait until he is wanted. He will come to where he is wanted. A.W. Tozer in his classic book called The Pursuit of God, I would recommend that to you, said this. I want deliberately to encourage a mighty longing after God. The lack of it, the lack of longing, has brought to us to us our very present low estate. The stiff and wooden quality about our religious lives is a result of our lack of holy desire. Complacency is a deadly foe of all spiritual growth. Acute desire, listen to me, acute desire must be present or there will be no manifestation of Christ to his people. He waits to be wanted. He waits to be, he will not come to a place where he is not desired. And the reason why there may not be a mighty longing, you may be sitting here and uh, there's, there's all, uh, you're all over the spectrum of faith, of unbelief, or, 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 or you think you believe, or, or whatever it is. Uh, but along the spectrum of faith, why is it? Why is it that we don't have a mighty longing for God? Now, and you may be there, and you may not be there. I'm not assuming anything about anyone here, but, but why is it, why is it that we don't have a mighty longing for God? I want to give you three reasons before we even begin. This is all intro, y'all. I haven't, you know, I haven't even prayed yet. <laughs> hey. And the reason, that, I, I want to give you three reasons why Uh, We may not have a mighty longing for God. We don't have a mighty longing for God because we're deceived. We're deceived. You sit here deceived. We sit here deceived because we've prayed a prayer, because we've done confirmation, because we've taken communion, because we come to church, because uh, maybe we serve or give or we, we grew up in church, but we're dead inside. We're dead inside to the things of God. And we think we've had new life because we have some external things around us, but inside there's no longing for God. We do these things because it's just how we've grown up. It's just who we are. It's just how we think. It's just uh, my culture, as it were, that I want to make myself right with Christ. I want to make myself right with God because of the things that I have done. But there's no affection. There's no mighty longing. So you may be deceived, but, uh, but maybe you truly do love Jesus. Uh, you don't, maybe you don't have a mighty longing, uh, not because you're deceived, but because you're distracted. We are, we are more distractible and distracted in our age than ever before. And we long for lesser things. And our heart longs for lesser things. We forget that the time is short and that the devil loves anything but to get you distracted. If he cannot get you hooked on heroin and pornography, he'll get you hooked on scrolling. Because that's enough to get you distracted. We give our hearts to things that are inconsequential. We give our hearts to things that will pass away with this age. We become distracted. And when we're full of junk, it's hard to actually be hungry for real food. It's very difficult to be hungry when we're full of junk food. 
And so we may not have a mighty longing because maybe we're deceived, maybe we are distracted, and maybe for some of us we have a defective theology, meaning this, that the truth, and we've spoken about this already, but the truth that we have God, right? If you're, here, if you're a Christian, if you're a Christian here today, if you've pledged allegiance to Jesus, if you've given your life to him, if you've moved from death to life, let me give you some good news. You have God. That is what 1 Peter 3 says. 1 Peter 3.18 says that when we come to Christ, we have God. Why? Why did Jesus go to the cross? So that we can have God. But we mistake that to mean that we no longer have to chase after him. That's what we mistake that to mean. We don't live with this reality that in all kinds of relationships, there is both an arrived and an always arriving. I've been married to Catherine now, what, 18 years, going on 18 years in a couple weeks. Known each other for 22 years. Now I have Catherine, she has me, right? There's, we've just, we ain't going anywhere, okay? Just sleep it off. If you're angry, sleep it off, because we're not going anywhere. We don't use the D word anymore in the house. We're, we're stuck, that's it, we're, this is it, this is it. There's absolutely no one in this world that knows me more than she does. No one. No one. There's no one in this world that knows her more than I do. Not her mama, daddy, sisters, friends. Nobody knows Catherine the way I do. But the moment that we stop pursuing one another is the day that our relationships begin to wither. Now, now am I trying to gain her? No, I have her but I still must pursue her. Is she trying to gain me? No, she has me, but she still must pursue. And this is just a facet of relationships. We think that once we have something, we no longer need to chase the thing. And that is defective theology and defective thinking for all relationships. There is at the very same moment an already having and a yet wanting, an already found and a still seeking. And because particularly as theological conservatives, uh, which I am a card-carrying member, by the way, uh, but because we have focused, and rightly so, on the fact that we, are not, we now have full access to God, where there was no access to God, now we have access to God through the blood of Jesus. I have full access to God the same way that my children have full access to me. And yet we confuse that with with stagnation. We confuse that with, with believing that therefore we no longer have to chase God, that there is no more to have of God. Listen, listen, in a billion years, when we are on this renewed earth, right? If you believe that, that heaven is, that we leave, that's false, that's not in the scriptures. If we, the, the earth will be renewed and we will be here reigning with Christ forever. If you think that in a trillion years, you'll be like, I'm getting a little bit bored of this Jesus guy. No, there will always be always, always be more to know of God. And so how much more, how much more now should we pursue and chase after God? That right now we have the promises of God. Right now the promises of God are yes and amen, but we've stopped swimming. We've stopped pursuing. We pit resting in God against pursuing God with reckless abandon because we feel that to pursue God is somehow to communicate that we don't have him really. That somehow we're trying to earn him. It's not about earning anything, but it is about putting the effort in to get in to know him just a little bit more. I, I want to quote A.W. Tozer just one more time, maybe one more time, maybe a couple more times. How tragic that we, in this dark day, have had our seeking done for us by our teachers. We pay people. We pay people to search for God. You just give me a sermon. You do the work. Just give me the leftovers. We pay people to do our seeking for us. Everything is made to center upon the initial act of quote-unquote accepting Christ, and we are not expected thereafter to crave any further revelation of God to our souls. We have been snared in the coils of spurious logic, which insists that if we have found him, we need no more seek him. And that is a lie, because God will not come to where he's not wanted. We focus on the initial aspect of entering into the kingdom, and that's right and true, but it's like being invited into someone's house and staying at the door. Imagine, imagine if I invite you to the house, right? We're moving, by the way, pray for us. But imagine, hey, we move, come, let's have a house, and everyone just stands at the door. This is a beautiful door frame. My Lord, how'd you get this door frame? And you never go in. 
You, you never, because you're so focused on the initial act of entering the kingdom that you forget to actually explore. You forget to go in. You forget to enjoy. You forget to pursue. Because this is what we're going to learn today. That God comes near to those who want him. That God responds and is attracted to faith in him. That God refuses, listen to me, that God refuses to work in places that refuse him. And so before we look at the two examples of Jesus marveling at faith, let me pray for us as we open up God's word together. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your goodness to us. We thank you for your grace to us. And we need your help this morning. Holy Spirit, I pray that in your sovereignty, you would open up blind eyes, unclog ears, renew hearts, do spiritual surgery in this room this morning, I pray. We're not playing around here. Eternity is at stake. Where we will go when you return, where we will go when we pass away is at stake. And so open our eyes, Lord. And more than that, more than where we go, the glory that you deserve, Jesus, the praise that you deserve that you're not currently getting, that is at stake. And so I, I pray that you would open up blind eyes this morning. Help me to forget the things that are not going to be helpful. Help me to remember the things that will be and let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. And the church said, and the church said, Peggy Smith, Peggy Smith was 84 years old and she was blind. Christine, her sister, was 82 and had severe arthritis. So bad was her arthritis that oftentimes she would be keeled over on herself, but they prayed. They would hold uh, nightly prayer meetings from 10 p.m. to 3 a.m. praying for revival to come. They were praying for God to show up. And in one of those meetings, they received a vision, as it were, that their local church that was dying out would soon be filled with young people. A church that had no young people, a church that had been dead, would soon be revived. And they saw a strange man in the pulpit, which they didn't know. They didn't know who this was in their vision. And from that point, the local minister and the elders would join them in prayer twice a week in a barn. And in the early hours of uh, winter's morning, it's told, beginning in 1949, a little college, uh, cottage uh, in, in a, a small bit village called Barvis on the Isle of Lewis in the Scottish Hebrides, they would be constantly found in prayer. One morning, God visited the sisters in a special way, giving them this unbreakable assurance that he was on the move, that the prayers that they were praying uh, would be answered soon. Peggy, in Gaelic, their only language, she told her sister Christine this. She said, this is what God promised. I will pour water upon him that is thirsty and floods upon the dry ground. And she said this, and we are dealing with a covenant-keeping God. Now, during this time, uh, uh, the, the spiritual climate in the Hebrides was very dry. It was very uh, religious. There was strict uh, Sabbath observance. They, were, they would uphold traditional practices. They were ensuring that no one strayed from orthodoxy. The community was outwardly religious, okay? There was very little affection. There was very little life, but they were very outwardly religious. There was almost no interest in Jesus amongst uh, uh, the young uh, and the youth in that time and in that place, but they prayed. And they believed that this strange minister that they'd seen in this vision was none other, none other than a man called Duncan Campbell, they would later find out. And so they invited Duncan Campbell to their small church. He was reluctant to go at first, but he answered the call. And when he arrived in Barvis, he found a very spiritually stagnant community. And I want to simply quote, uh, uh, um, Colin Whitaker wrote a, a, a really fantastic little book on revivals. And I want to quote what their experience was when he arrived at Barvis. Quote, there was a great expectancy in Duncan Campbell's first meeting in the Barvis church. A deacon declared, Mr. Campbell, God is hovering over. He is going to break through. But though it was a good meeting with good singing and liberty and prayer and preaching, there was nothing more. At the end of the service, however, the same deacon told Duncan, do not be discouraged. He is coming. I hear already the rumblings of heaven's chariot wheels. Then he suggested to the already exceedingly travel-weary Duncan that they go and spend the night in prayer. About 30 of them retired to a nearby cottage. Duncan Campbell described what happened like this. God was beginning to move. 
The heavens were opening. We were there on our faces before God. Three o'clock in the morning came and God swept in. About a dozen men and women lay prostrate on the floor, speechless. Something had happened. We knew that the forces of darkness were going to be driven back and men were going to be delivered. We left the cottage at 3 a.m. to discover men and women seeking God. I walked across a country road and found three men on their faces crying to God for mercy. There was a light in every home. No one seemed to think of sleep. What had happened in Barvis was repeated over and over again. Duncan Campbell said that a feature of the revival was, listen to this, the overwhelming sense of the presence of God. His sacred presence was everywhere. Sinners found themselves unable to escape it. For example, a young man was witnessed to by a new convert and became a Christian at a club. Duncan Campbell once wrote this, those who seek God for revival must be prepared, must be prepared for God to work in his own way and not according to their program. But listen to this. But his sovereignty does not relieve us of our responsibility. God is the God of revival, but humanity, man, is the human agent through whom revival is possible. Desire for revival is one thing. Confident anticipation that our desire will be fulfilled is another. Mm. This is Duncan Campbell and Peggy and Christine. Desire for revival is one thing, but confident anticipation that our desire will be fulfilled is another. And it's this this theme, this topic of confident anticipation, which I want to call faith this morning, that if we exist, if we exist as a church to pursue the presence of God for the sake of the world, then what does faith have to do with it? What does a lack of faith have to do with it? What does it even mean to have or lack faith? faith? Is it a substance that is transferable like a germ? Does God respond to faith or does it not matter? Well, according to the text read earlier and contrary to our lazy theology, God, by virtue of being in covenant with us human beings, is embedded in the world. He's involved. His, he, he, his chips, if, if, if this were a poker game, his, he's all in. Right? He pushes everything in. He's not holding back. He's not calling a bluff. He's not waiting to see what he's all in. He is involved with us now. He cares about what happens in the world. He cares about the way in which these things come about. We can be confident that if we read the scriptures rightly, that God is interested. He's interested in you. Can you get that? Like the God who created all the universe, regardless of who you are, regardless of what your status is, whether you're, he's interested in you. And he's interested in saying this, I want you to come to work with me. I want to do something in the world, and I want you. I don't need you. Don't get it twisted. Don't get it twisted. Don't overinflate your importance here. I don't need you, but I want you. And that's so much better than being needed. When, when we're needed for something, that's one thing. But when we're wanted, oh, that's special. And so it's God's desire and God's will to respond and act according to our faith. Now, I know that that sounds crazy to some of us, and I'm going to define what faith is in just a moment, but we need to have a radical openness to allow the scriptures to reform our theology, because this is what we normally do. We, we, we read scriptures that we may not agree with, and we put them through the sieve of our theology, okay? And we say, well, this, this, this mustn't be true. When, when Eliza read that Jesus was unable, not, he, not that he didn't choose to, but he was unable to act because of the lack of faith in his hometown. What do we do with that? Do, do, we, do we just, like, that's, that's a question, not a real one, don't answer just now. But it's a real question for us to, to, to deal with. What do we do with things that don't fit into our neat theological categories? We cannot, we cannot push scripture through the sieve of our theology. Rather, our theology must constantly be reformed by God's holy word, read rightly, read in community, read in the spirit, we can. We can't just make scripture say whatever we want it to say. And so for some in the room, you hear me say that the sovereign God responds to our human faith and alarm bells go off. Like we're, like we're, going, like we're having hives at the moment. Like, what do you mean? Are we, like, what kind of church is this, right? That, that, what, what are you saying? That God responds to faith? That God was unable to work in this place because of the lack of faith? What does that mean? Is he teaching, is Arnaldo teaching that if we had enough faith that God would move, if we had enough of it? And so let me clarify. I am not saying that if you had more faith 
God would move. And that because you have no faith or little faith that God is withholding revival. Because I'm not, I'm not talking about the intensity of faith. Okay? I'm not talking about the level of faith as it were. Rather, I'm talking about the nature, the kind, and the object of your faith. I'm not talking about degrees of faith. I'm talking about the faith that comes from simply knowing who God is. Do you know him? Do you know him personally? Because if you did, you couldn't, you couldn't help but have faith in him. Because you'd know who he is. And you would know that he's a covenant-keeping God. And you would see it the way he's worked in history and the way he works in Scripture. When missionaries were sent to Tonga, they had trouble translating the New Testament into the Tongan language at the time. At the time, they didn't have a word-to-word translation of the word faith. And so missionaries, they struggled. They struggled to translate this one word, a very important word, by the way, or concept, into the native language. And then one day, they came across a word in Tongan that communicates sitting in a hammock. And so when they were translating the New Testament, they would use this word, and I'm, I'm, not, I'm not even going to try. But they, they would use this word that meant sitting in a hammock. It's not like sitting in a chair. Right? Have, you ever been on a, have you ever been on a hammock? Not good. It's a very scary experience. It's not like sitting in a chair. Sitting into a hammock takes our whole selves. You're either all in or you're not. You cannot half, half it, halfway it, right? You just can't. You have to go all in on a hammock. Laying into a hammock is a picture of what faith is. It's giving your whole self to this thing. It's trusting this thing. It's giving, it's seeing what it is and saying, yes. Yeah, it is what it, you, you, you are what it is. Either way, laying into a hammock is a picture of what faith is. Now let's imagine me and you and two hammocks of identical structural integrity. Okay, and I'm pretty kind of sure that this hammock is going to hold me up and carry me, but I'm not going to embarrass myself by trying to hop on too confidently because I've seen videos of what happens and I'm a little bit scared, but I get in and it's holding me up. Now imagine you, you, you've been on this hammock a thousand times. You got no problem. You got, you got strong faith in the hammock. You jump in and it holds you. Now tell me, is it the strength of your faith in the hammock that is holding you? No, it's the, it's the structural integrity of the thing in which you've put your faith in. It's the hammock that's holding you, right? My little faith, as it were, as we're thinking about it, my little faith has not much to do with the fact that the hammock is holding me or not. It's the thing in which I have put my faith in that matters. We're both being held by the hammock. It's not the intensity or the level of strength, but the type of faith. It's the type, it's the, it's the kind It's a thing in which we are putting our hope in. And when the one, listen to me, when the one, when the one in whom, Jesus, in whom you are putting your faith in, says things like this, for God so loved the world. Now, so, let me just, let me just give you a quick, this isn't, this isn't speaking of the amount so much. He's speaking about the way in which, for God loved the world in this way. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Furthermore, this is good and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior. Listen to this. Who desires? What does God desire? What does God want? He wants that no one, That all people, he wants all people, God's desire, God's heart. If you think you have a bleeding heart for for non-Christians, if you you think you have this missionary zeal, it it, it comes from him. This is is alpha energy right here. This is is unmatched, okay? If If we think, if we think that in God's heart is anything else but this, God desires that all people be saved. And to come to the knowledge of the truth. And when you pledge your allegiance, which is what faith is. When you pledge your allegiance. When you, give, uh, when you sit in this hammock, as it were, uh, of this God. 
when this is the king you serve, when this is the king that you worship, when this is the king that you behold, then you will begin to take on the desires of this king. And if his desire is that no one may perish, if his desire was to come into the world, not to condemn it, but to save it, if his desire was to give up his life as a ransom for yours, if his desire is that none would perish in their sin, then as you spend time with him in his word, you will become like him because we become what we behold. You become ultimately what you behold. What, listen, why is it? Why is it? Now, I don't know what the estimation, what the current estimation is, but why is it that things like TikTok and Instagram and Facebook, why is it that they're estimated? You don't pay for it because you're the currency. You know why you don't pay for these free apps? Because you're the bait. Why? Because they know what we so often fail to remember, that what you give your attention to will ultimately be what you become. What you behold, you become. Follow me here. When you behold him, you become like him. And you have his perspective and you take on his desires. And it's not a leap to say, it's not a leap to say, we not only desire revival now, but we have a confident anticipation because, because we know him. This isn't about the intensity of your faith. This isn't about you trying to G yourself up. This is about just knowing who he is, knowing what he wants, knowing what he desires and knowing that he's able. And this, this is the faith that Jesus responds to. This is the faith that Jesus is dying to see in his community. This is the faith that will move mountains. This is the faith that will pray people into the kingdom of God. This is the faith that will see people healed and eyes opened. This is the faith that will bear witness to the kingdom of God. This is the faith that will remind the enemy that he is already a defeated foe. This is a faith that will bring the gospel to the nations and to your neighbors. This is the kind of faith that Jesus marvels at. Faith simply is this. Believing that God wants to save and will save and that we act according to that belief. That we actually jump into that. You can't, listen, faith is not, faith is not this. Faith is not get, getting out the spec sheet on the hammock and then being able to explain all the dimensions and how it works, right? I can, man, I can tell you how it works. I can only even show you photos of other people who've been in it to prove to you that it works. That's not faith. That's knowledge. The devil has that, but that's not faith. Faith is saying, let me tell, let me show you photos. Let me give you the dimensions. And now I'm going to jump in. That's faith. And faith is praying to God what God has instilled in you. Faith is saying to God, Lord, you've said it in your word and I'm holding you up to it. We, we are a little bit too polite in our prayers. A little, have you read the Psalms? Have you read the Psalms? We're a little bit too uh, buttoned up in our prayers to God. The psalmist will say, you said this. Jeremiah will say, you deceived me. You said you would do this and you didn't. And we hold, we hold up a mirror to God and say, this is who you are. Prove it. Do it. Save. Renew. Bring fresh water where there's dry land. Blow on these dry bones. Cleanse us from our, do it. Why? Not because we're trying to get God to do something he doesn't want to do, because we're saying back to God what he's instilled in us already. There was a part of town during the Hebrides revival that seems to have been left virtually untouched by the revival that took place between 1949 and 1952. Stornoway was the capital of the Isle of Lewis, seems to have been completely bypassed. The revival came only to small towns and villages in the Hebrides, and the reason thought was that there were ministers in that town that didn't have a weak faith. It's not that they wanted to believe, it's that they actively opposed faith. That is the opposite. And this is what we see in the life and ministry of Jesus. Remember, Jesus marvels only twice in the entirety of the Gospels. Twice he marvels at faith being present and faith being absent. And this is shocking to us because this is what the text tells us. It says this, And he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. That seems mighty to me. But he could do no mighty work. Why? Because he marveled. He marveled because of their unbelief. And he went about among the villages teaching. Jesus, this is happening in his hometown, and he's held by con in contempt 
by the people who know him. This is where we get the, the saying, this text, that a prophet has no honor in his hometown. You should see the way my kids talk to me, right? Now, I'm not a prophet. The last thing they're doing, they think in their minds, is I'm not pledging allegiance to this guy. I know him. I've seen him, with a, I've seen him growing up. I, I know his, I know his, don't you know his sisters? We know his mom, Mary, Mary's his mom. But I'm not pledging allegiance to this kid that we've seen grow up before our eyes. This is Mary's kid. We, we know him. He, he swings a hammer. Like he's, he's, a, he's a stonemason. We, we're not going to pledge allegiance. We're not going to give our faith to him. He's talking reckless. He's, he's, he's talking with, he's speaking with authority. He has no degrees on his, on his wall. And he's speaking with this kind of authority. Who, do, who does he think he actually is? And it's precisely this. It's precisely their offense at him, their unbelief. It's not weak faith that prevents Jesus. What does Jesus say about weak faith? All you need is the faith the size of a mustard seed. It's not about weak faith. It's about unbelief. Strong faith, the, 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 the opposite of strong faith isn't weak faith. It's unbelief. And, and Jesus is prevented. Listen to this. Jesus is prevented from doing mighty works there. And if you have no category in your theological world, if you have no category in your thinking for God responding to our faith or lack thereof, then you need to reevaluate your theology, plain and simple. And so Jesus marvels at their unbelief and is unable to perform mighty works there. The only other time that Jesus is said to marvel is at the faith of a man in Matthew chapter 8. In Mark 6, his own people, his own hometown, where he grew up, they disregard him. In Matthew 8, there's a Gentile centurion who places his trust in him. On the one hand, Jesus marvels at the lack of faith from where it's, suppo where it's supposed to be found. On the other hand, Jesus marvels where there is faith, where there shouldn't be. And without even asking, the centurion, he simply states his need. Do you notice? He doesn't, he doesn't ask Jesus to heal his servant. He doesn't ask Jesus. He just simply states his desire. He just simply states his need. He simply states, this is what's happening. My servant is sick and is dying. And without even asking Jesus, Jesus obliges. And Jesus is like, bet. Is he sick? Almost, I'm going to lead the way and I'll come and I'll heal him. But the type of faith that this man has in Jesus, the type, not the intensity, but the type. He has the kind of faith that knows that Jesus is who he says he is. That's it. Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus to be the Jesus of the Gospels? Do you know Jesus to be the Jesus of the Scriptures? Do you know Jesus to be the Jesus of the book of Revelation who is now sitting enthroned in heaven? Do you know that Jesus? Because that's what faith is. And so this man believes that Jesus is who he says he is. And he takes Jesus at his word. And without so much taking, listen, without so much taking a step in the direction of this man's house, he says, your servant is healed. And it says, the text says, that very hour, that moment. Listen, when Jesus heard this, he marveled. And he said to those who followed him, truly, I tell you, with no one in Israel, where it should be found in my people, Right? Jesus was a Jew. Jesus was an Israelite. And he's saying, in my people, the people who I come from, the people who bleed the same blood as I do, the people who read the same scriptures as I do, they should be the ones to have faith. Truly, I've seen no, no one in Israel with this kind of faith. And to the centurion, he said, go. Let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that time very moment. Jesus is saying this to the centurion. You believe who I am. You've pledged allegiance to me by trusting that I am who I say I am. And this is what we're seeing in these stories of Marvel. Jesus is attracted to the faith of his people. This, this, this is what's this is not, I'm not trying to just give you my opinion here. This is the text. Jesus is attracted to the faith of his people. Jesus responds to the faith of his people. God waits to be wanted as it were. And where he is wanted, he will come. There is no other way. There can be no other way. And so maybe you're a little confused. Maybe you've forgotten who he was. Maybe you've forgotten that like the centurion says, I know what authority is. I'm a man under authority. Do, do you forget? Do you, do you forget Matthew 28, all authority in heaven has been given to me. God will not be an unwanted guest. He just won't. 
He will not allow himself to not be wanted, and he will bypass the places that simply do not desire his presence. And this is my point, that the presence of God will come to where the presence of God is wanted. And if we want to be a church that pursues the presence of God, not just for our sake, but for the sake of the world, then we must want his presence. We must want his glory. Where there is spiritual hunger, where there is a desire to see God move, the faith of God's people in him, that's their calling card. And when God sees the faith, even the size of a mustard seed, even, even as we, we say, Jesus, you are Lord, he's eager to act on behalf of his people. Why? Because the desire of his people, that God would come down, right, and visit them in power and in grace and in revival and in renewal, doesn't find its genesis in them. If you, listen, if you want God here, if you desire God here, it's not because of you. It's because he's placed that desire in you. In the end, God is responding to the loyalty, to the allegiance, to the faith that he has made possible in the first place. And so, where are we going with this? If God goes to where he is wanted, if God waits to be wanted to act, how is it then that we grow in our desire and our wanting? What does faith actually look like? Remember, faith isn't about trying really, really, really hard to believe something. That's not what I'm talking about. Faith's strength doesn't come from the intensity of your faith or the intensity of your belief. Faith's strength comes from the object of your faith, what you're trusting. And let me try to paint one more picture. Imagine, imagine uh, we are living 4,500 years ago or so, give or take. And we've been slaves in Egypt all our lives. And we were born into slavery and we know nothing else but this. And then we hear about this liberator, Moses, who comes along and who is beginning to speak truth to power in the Oval Office, as it were. And he is demanding now that, uh, 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 that he allow the people to leave and go worship Yahweh in the wilderness. And when we hear about this liberator, Moses, who is speaking truth to power and demanding that we be released to go and worship our God, and nine and time after time, what happens? Uh, Pharaoh, our leader, our, our king, as it were, he, he, he refuses Moses. And so what does God do? God sends 10 plagues, none of which affect the people of God. And the 10th one is announced. And Moses proclaims this, that the angel of death this very night, tonight, imagine if I, tonight, the angel of death is going to be loosed upon this land. And every single firstborn in the land of Egypt will be killed. And then imagine, Moses gives us this instructions. If you want the angel of death to pass over your house, this is what you need to do. You need to take a lamb of about a one-year-old a one lamb. You need to slay the lamb. You need to take some of that blood. You need to paint your doorpost around with that blood. And if you do that, and if you do that, the angel of death will pass over. So you take a lamb, you kill it, you take the blood, and you confidently, with all the, with all the faith, like, you're like, yep, Moses said it. I've seen the other plagues. I've seen it come to pass. This one's going to come to pass too. And so all, all, almost with, with this un, like, wavering confidence, you do this. You take the lamb, you kill it, without a shred of doubt in your mind that the angel of death will pass over your home tonight and spare your firstborn son. And you sleep like a baby that night, in fact. Now me, I take a lamb, I kill it, I take the blood, and I nervously, ooh, I can't sleep that night. I can't sleep because I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I've never seen this before. I've never heard this before. I'm not sure that this is going to help. But I, I, I kill the lamb, and I nervously, doubting, I'm barely able to get any sleep tonight. I don't know if this is going to work, but I did the thing according to the word of Moses, God's prophet. And the angel of death comes that evening and tell me, whose son survives, mine or yours? Mine or yours? Both. Why? Because you were really confident? Because you, 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 with all, all, all the, the confidence that you could muster, you said, absolutely, this is going to come to pass. You were saved. Your son was saved. Your firstborn was saved. Not because of the intensity of your faith or your belief, but the blood. It was the thing in which you did. It's the thing in which you enacted your faith, your belief. 
Does your son survive because of the strength of your belief or does uh, of your belief or does he survive based on the blood that the angel saw on the door? Does my son survive based on the strength of my belief or does he survive based on the blood that the angel saw on the door? You see, it's not about, about the strength or the intensity. It's about the strength of the thing in which you're putting your trust in. And this is what God is asking us to do. This is for you. Believe that I am who I am. That's it. Believe that I can heal. Believe that I can save. Believe that I sent my son into the world to save it. Believe that I desire that none perish. And how do we do that? We do that by simply being with him. You cannot have a proxy relationship with God. You cannot depend on this. Now, this is a lifeline to us. I don't know what I would do without y'all. This is a lifeline, but this is not the, the locus of it has to be in the quiet place with him. You have to know him yourself. You have to get to know Jesus yourself in the quietness. You know, when, when community fails us, and it does, it's failed me before, it's failed you before, and if it hasn't, it will. Don't worry about it. It's coming. The beauty, the treasure, the treasure in that is you realize community is fantastic, but we don't exist for community. A church that exists for community will die if it doesn't have it, but a church that exists for Jesus, a church that exists to pursue the presence of God, that is what we're on about. Community will be a byproduct, a beautiful byproduct, but we must see that even when community fails us, oh, the sweetness of that failure. You will learn, if you haven't learned yet, you will learn the sweetness of the failure of community when all you have is Jesus, and you realize that's all you actually ever needed. And then, and then when that's true of you, you can enter and make this community a beautiful place because you're not depending on it for what only Jesus can give you. And so how do we do this? We do this by simply being with Jesus. I know this is not revolutionary. Maybe you were looking for more. Maybe you're looking for a silver bullet. Like, how do we unlock this thing? Do we need to lock in and get this, get this revival thing going? You know, do we need to build a tent? Do we, what, what do we do? What do we do? Be with Jesus. Behold him. Because you become what you behold. You become what you behold. You become what you behold. What you behold, you will become. And what you give your attention to will shape your imagination. We know this. What, 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 what shapes your imagination shapes your desire. What shapes your desire will shape your choices. And what is your life but your choices? It all begins where we place our mind's eye. And when you behold him, you will get to know him. And you know him that you know that he's not only able but he is more than willing to shower his people with his presence. That, that's what he wants for us. Go ahead, I dare you. I dare you to spend time with Jesus and see if this isn't the case. Y'all may know that honey is sweet, but have you tasted it yourself? You'll learn that if you spend enough time in his presence, that he is more than willing and more than able to shower his people with a fresh outpouring of conviction. You will know that he is more than willing and more than able to shower his people with a fresh outpouring of repentance. You will know that he is more than willing and more than able to shower his people with a fresh sense of his holiness. He is more than willing and more than able to finish the work that he has started in us. He is more willing and more than able to break the chains of false theological doctrines that keep us from desiring what he desires. I don't want to be storn away. I don't want God to pass over this church I don't want to be like the hometown of Jesus. I want to have the type of faith that the centurion had. I want to have the type of faith that Peggy had and that Duncan had and that Christine had and that the centurion who lived 2,000 years ago had who said this, I know you have authority on heaven and earth. I know you have authority to open blind eyes. I know you have authority to heal the sick. I know you have the authority to bring people from death to life, some of which you are in this room right now. I know that those in this very room who don't know you, who don't even know that they're dead in their trespasses and sins, you can wake them up, Jesus, even now. I know that you love them, that you've come for them. And so, Jesus, I pray that you would release from bondage now. I know that you have authority to grant the new birth. I know that you have authority to open the floodgates of heaven and pour your mercy and power onto us. I know that you have authority to just say the word. You don't even have to move your, just say the word and it's done. I know that Jesus, where you are wanted, you will come. 
and we want you here. That's the prayer I want us to have. The prayer I want us to have is that, God, we have you, and yet we want more of you. God, we've seen your glory in the gospel, and yet we want to behold your glory. May you hide us in the cleft, and may we behold your glory. Jesus, you are the cleft in the rock for us. There is nothing we could do to ever deserve you. We are more sinful in this room than we could ever admit. We, we don't have the capacity. Our culture, our families of origin, we don't have the capacity to admit that we're broken. But we are more sinful than we can ever imagine. But listen to this. In that, you are more loved than you can ever dare dream. And so we pray, Lord, to do a special work in us even now. Reveal yourself to us in a fresh way. And may we too, listen, I want to be like Peggy. I want to be like Christine. I want to be like Duncan. I want our, our, our hope not to be in what we do, but our confident anticipation that God will do what he already wants to do. And so I want to spend a moment in just silence. I want to honor God, not only with our words, but with our silence. And then I'm going to pray and then we're going to sing together. So let's just behold him in our mind's eye for just a moment. Holy Spirit, come. We pray. We pray as your church that you would revive us. We pray that we would believe simply that you are who you say you are. That there is no shifting in you. That just because these words were written and copied for us 2,000 years ago, Lord, you haven't changed. You haven't changed. You haven't changed. We hear that as such an uh, often time, as such a, a negative thing about ourselves. Man, this person hasn't changed a bit. And yet we say that with full joy and confidence. This God has not changed a bit. You still are in the business of redeeming. You still are in the business of renewing. You still are in the business of waking people up to realize that there's no religion, there's no outward work, there's no, uh, 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 there's, there's, there's no amount of prayer or Bible reading or church attendance or being born to certain parents or not being born to certain parents or being born in a certain place or not. There's nothing. We must be born from up above. We must be reborn. And this is your work. And so, Holy Spirit, I pray now that you would open blind eyes. That you would help people to see the glory of Jesus. That you would help them to see that you are high and lifted up. And yet, at the very same time, you are near the brokenhearted. You are near us. Who, who has a God? Deuteronomy 4.7. Who has a God like this God who is so near to his people? God is nearer to us than we are to our very selves. And so, Holy Spirit, again, again, we plead with you, we pray, we ask that you would save now. Not because we are, uh, not, not, not because of the intensity of our belief, but knowing of who, who you are. This is who you are. When Moses asked you what your name was on Mount Sinai, on the Mount Horeb, when Moses asked you and he said, who shall I say sent me? And you respond, I am who I am. I is who I is. I was who I was and I will be who I will be. You cannot be defined by anything outside of you. And so we thank you for your radical freedom, your sovereignty, your glory, your majesty. That will come and I pray that this majesty will fall on us like a heavy weight now that we will feel your presence, that we will know that you are here and that even unbelievers would walk out, Lord, knowing that you were here. Would you shake us to our core, we pray now. We thank you and we love you, Jesus. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. And what we do as a response to this, and maybe 
Maybe, maybe you feel what John Wesley felt. John Wesley was a minister, preached all over the place, would go back and forth from Europe over to America. And he said one day as he was reading a preface to a commentary on the book of Romans written by Martin Luther, he said he felt a strange warming of his heart. And this is a time where he, he felt, man, I was, I was outwardly religious. I did a lot of things for God, but I didn't have affection for God. And maybe this is for you the time where you get to proclaim your allegiance to Jesus. Maybe for the hundredth time, but maybe for the first time as we take communion together. And remember, communion is a symbol of, of what God has done to make it possible for him to send the Spirit so that we can be woken up to his glory and our sinfulness. And the blood represents the, 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 the blood, the, the juice rather, represents the blood that was spilt by Jesus. And the bread represents the body that was broken so that we will be healed. His, his blood was spilt so that we can keep our own. His blood is the one that is on the, the, the lentil of our life. His blood is the one that cleanses us and heals us and saves us. His body now is still, even in heaven, with scars to remind us that the only reason why we will ever see him as friend rather than judge is because of those scars. And that's what we do when we take the bread and when we take the cup. And so I invite you to do that in your time and I invite you to stand and to sing with us.